This is just a difference um, of using a little bit too much enzyme. Like I said, nutritionally also, we are talking about dietary fibers, we are talking about fibers which, are, uh, which can carry an EFSA claim, and we are talking about prebiotics. So most of you know about probiotics, which are these live organisms that you can take to improve gut health and therefore host health. Well, prebiotics are actually the food for the probiotics. I know that um, Jeroen Raas is giving a presentation a bit later on, so I won't go any further into this, but I'm sure he will um, do a very good job at explaining to you what pro and prebiotics are in the context of gut health. But what we needed, if we want to understand these phenomena, these phenomena, we need analytics to measure iron monoxide and content, we need to measure composition and size. And the thing is that you have to do that against a complex background. We have all this starch flying around, we have beta-glucan flying around, we have aminogalactan peptides, we have sucrose, we have a lot of things flying around, and still we want to know something about aminoxide and Sigantis background. So what did we do? We, um, we adapted a method, which is the very typical Anglis and Cumming methods from the 1984, I think, and we adapted it in such a way that you cannot only measure total uh, sugar content, but that you can also measure single reducing ends. Yeah. Most of reducing sugar analysis are colorimetric methods, which do not allow you to distinguish between reducing silos, reducing glucose, reducing rabinose, or whatever. So what we did is adapt this method, so at the end, we know how much reducing silos we have, reducing rabinose, and so on. So we can play with it. Another adaptation allows you to just measure free sugars. So having these three values, um, you can very well analyze non-starch carbohydrates for total content, reducing sugar content, free neutral sugar content. And that allows you, against again this background, which is rather complex, allows you to determine the degree of polymerization. Uh, for aromatic silane, it's arabinose plus silos divided by reducing silos. Degree of substitution, which is a measure for um, the ease with which a uh, oligosaccharide or polymer can be degraded by enzymes, by xylanases. So if you look at uh, wheat malt, for example, typical arabinoxylin content around 6%, barley malt, the same thing. Degree of substitution would be around 0 0.5, which means degradable. What we see is that a relatively low amount of arabinoxylin is actually extractable. Yeah? And that the degree of polymerization of these arabinoxylin is already rather low, probably due to the malting process. Now, what does it do in beer? Yeah? If we do this for malt, how do these things evolve in beer? Is there a sharp increase in the amount of extractable aromoxylin? Yes, no? Well, we did a screening of a larger number of uh, beer varieties, a lot of them Belgian uh, beers. Call me a bit um, chauvinistic, but chauvinistic in, in English means something else, of course. Uh, so what we saw there, uh, we measured aromoxylin content amongst others. We have average degree of polymerization. We have average degree of substitution. Next to other uh, different measures, uh, free sugars, uh, maltodextrins, and so on. If you make this graph, what you see is that your correlation between aromoxylin level in the final beer and original extract is actually a very nice uh, correlation which actually means that whatever brewing br process is being used, the amount of aromoxylin that is additionally solubilized during the br brewing process is very small. Yeah? So this aromoxylin that you find here is mostly the aromoxylin that has been solubilized during the malting process and not so much aromoxylin being solubilized during the brewing process. Now, why should we care about these aromoxylins in the beer? Um, well, concentrations are not so high, but the question is, they're not that small either. So the largest aromoxylin average degree, of average degree of polymerization that we found was 60, which means that you're talking about molecules with an average size of 8 kilodalton. That's not large, but that's not small either. Yeah? So the question is, to what extent do they impact viscosity or mouthfeel? And secondly, if you're on a good night and you're drinking three of these high alcohol, strong, dark beers, you actually consume two gram aromoxylin 
carboxylic and oligosaccharides. And what do we know? That consumption of 2.5 grams of oligosaccharides is sufficient to provide a physiological effect in humans. Now, I'm not allowed to say that beer is good for you, and I'm not going to say that. I know you cannot use it. But still, it's something to consider. We do have these iron oxide and oligosaccharides, uh, smaller iron oxides, in the beer, which do provide health benefits. OK, yeast metabolites. Um, this is a picture that I took from one of um, Kevin's and, and my students, Elham Ashlan Kohi. And what you see here is actually uh, yeast cells embedded in a dough matrix. Why? Clearly, yeast is a key ingredient in bread making. Without yeast, no uh, carbon dioxide, no leavening, and so on. We get leavening, we get flavor development, we get um, changes in dough matrix rheology. And these are things that we are studying at the moment. So we do want to know what about leavening, what about flavor, what about dough matrix rheology. Because each of these, of course, are going to define the quality of your final product. Rheology will define the, uh, the size of your bread, the fluffiness or the uh, softness of your bread, flavor, of course, aroma, and leavening will also determine softness. And yeast will do all of this through its metabolites. So we are interested in these metabolites. We try to analyze them. One of the methods is ion exclusion chromatography. Another is uh, high-performance anion exchange chromatography, allowing us to differentiate between different metabolites. So we did this analysis on dough. And uh, what did we see? Uh, if we start with a dough to which sucrose has been added, sucrose would be the major component. We have uh, maltose as fermentable sugars, glucose, fructose. And after three hours, 5% yeast, we obtain this on a carbon basis. So 45% um, ethanol carbon, 20% um, carbon in uh, carbon dioxide, glycerol, of course. But also some of these nice little acids, succinic acids, um, acetic acid in a rather strange uh, ratio, uh, 10 times more succinic acid in this example than here. The question is, what do these um, metabolites do? And I try to show it to you with this movie. So this is a control dough, and this is a machine that tries to blow a bubble out of your dough. And what you see in the control dough you blow this bubble, it's rather large, it's very strong. The moment that I add ethanol or succinic acid in the levels that is produced in dough by yeast, you see that you get a dough ball which is much less firm. So instead of having this nice elastic properties, being able to blow a film and so on, like in a control dough, you see that these properties get lost in this dough. It, it breaks very fast. So this is not a good thing. So we looked at ethanol, we looked at glycerol, acetic acid, succinic acids, and of course we, th we said to ourselves, okay, how can we now try to modify the metabolite profiles uh, in these yeasts? Um, looking specifically at succinic acid, acetic acid. And we said, okay, let's do this in dough, and at the same time, let's look at fermentation medium. Why? Because it would be so much nicer if we could do large-scale screenings in fermentation broth um, rather than having to go through a dough phase all the time. So we did, in some experiments, go through the effort of doing things again in fermentation medium. First thing that we tried, look at different physiological stages of the yeast. So uh, I'm going to skip this. So what we had is the typical yeast growth curve. We said, OK, we're going to harvest yeast in each of these regions exponential growth, dioxic shift, post-dioxic shift, early stationary phase and later stationary phase, harvest, incorporate in dough, and then see what metabolites we would get out in dough and in uh, medium. And what was quite interesting to see is that the profiles for acetic acid and for succinic acid are not the same. So you do, in all instances, you get accumulation of the acids, um, as a function of uh, the region in which the yeast was harvested. Region A typically would provide the lowest um, acid levels. You would go up, and then if you go to late harvest, uh, 
uh, late stationary phase for acetic acid, you would go down again. If you look at uh, succinic acid, you see that the regions com cluster completely differently. Huh? And that only if you go to region F, region G, uh, and E, post arctic shift, that you actually get these higher succinic acid levels. Now, as we typically would uh, harvest yeast for bread making at post, um, at the late uh, stationary phase, that explains why we had these high levels of succinic acid in our products uh, rather than these high levels of acetic acid. And of course, pH is affected, yeah? Uh, up until a couple of years ago, people very often said, okay, it's mostly carbon dioxide that determines low pH. Well, actually, it's mostly the acids that do the trick, um, which is also illustrated by evolution of pH here as a function of fermentation time for each of the regions. Now, what we observed is, is something interesting in the sense that we could not relate breaking of dough, dough rupture so much to the amount of carbon dioxide that was produced by the yeast, but rather more to dough pH. Showing us that the impact of acids on what the dough does um, is, is much larger than the amount of carbon dioxide that you actually blow into the volume. pH mostly determined by the organic acids. Before the oxic shift, we have a larger contribution of acetic acid. After the oxic shift, both acetic and succinic. And if you go very far to the um, stationary phase, you have mostly succinic acid. Now the question, of course, uh, becomes, can we steer this balance? Because we want dough rheology to be as good as possible. We want metabolite profiles, in which application we want them to be as good as, pro as possible. So we can talk about using different yeast strains. We can talk about molecular engineering. Uh, first, we looked at uh, different yeast strains. We took fermentation medium, we took dough, and we analyzed a series of 25 yeast strains um, coming from the large collection that Kevin has in his lab, and also with nice contribution by Jan, uh, selecting strains. So we have four beer strains, four bioethanol strains, two sake, three spirits, 11 wine strains, and one well-performing bakery strain as control. We... Um, looked at ethanol production, and what we saw, uh, quite surprisingly, is that your yeasts almost all perform rather well in dough. In fermentation broth, okay, you have uh, 10 millimoles per gram of yeast. If you go to dough, we see that we reach nine uh, for the better ones. So, in spite of a very different system, a liquid system, versus a rather solid state system, you see that fermentation capacity is not really hampered by this very large difference in, um, in mobility in the system. What you do see is that there are some strains, to, uh, two beer strains, one sake strain, that perform much less in dough. Okay, so far this observation. Glycerol, we saw production a little bit more in fermentation medium than in dough, for some others, vice versa. But more interestingly, if you go to dough, what you see is that in the solid state system, or more solid state system, you have significant higher production of acetic acid compared to the fermentation medium. If you go to succinic acid, you see the opposite. So being in dough, being in a fermentation medium, actually will change the metabolite profiles that you're going to obtain which is nice to know if you are comparing both systems, be it for screening purposes, for other purposes. Then there was an additional experiment, so three of the yeast strains were actually uh, selected for a more uh, thorough investigation into mRNA expression analysis profile, so this was done by Elham, who was uh, uh, primarily supervised by Kevin, co-supervised by myself. So what we did is a bioethanol strain, wine strain, and a bread strain, uh, mRNA um, sequencing, so complete RNA sequencing. And what was clear is that at the first, uh, during the first six minutes, the first 60 minutes in the dough, you do have some strong adaptation of uh, all of the yeasts uh, to the system, and you go back to normal after 120 to 180 minutes. 
you do have different expression profiles between the three different yeasts. This also gave us some targets to, um, to look for to change acid balance uh, based on metabolic cycles. So we set out to um, produce some uh, knockout mutants in the TCA cycle. So we went for uh, aconitase, we went for isocytrate lyase, and what we saw is that our knockout mutants compared to the S288C strain, that our double knockout performed still relatively well. We couldn't complain, yeah, we saw worse. That fermentation was also rather well, a bit uh, compromised, but still. But we were indeed able to knock out, or not knock out, but reduce uh, succinic acid production significantly compared to our acetic acid production. Glycerol production remained rather stable. So this is one of the ways forward for us to try to modify acid profiles in the, in the bread dough, therefore trying to improve rheology and focus more on ethanol and uh, carbon dioxide rather than on the acids. So again, what does it all mean? Um, for dough, it's very clear. We have an impact on dough rheology. What is maybe more widely applicable is that your me yeast metabolite profiles change as a function of physiological state, which might or might not be something that you can work with. Um, genetic background, of course, in gene knockouts, but also, importantly, solid versus liquid uh, environment. Second observation was that our bread, non-bread yeast actually perform rather well in our system. So it's quite surprising. Get a beer yeast, get a wine yeast. It had beer, wine have to ferment for several days, weeks. Bread yeast has to do its trick in two hours. And still we were able to bake good breads out of non-bread yeast. So that is, that's some remarkable results. And lastly, for us, the search for low-acid producing yeast is open. So maybe some take-home messages, um, something that you have learned by now, I think. So in spite of obvious dissimilarities between beer and bread, we do have similarities in substrates, enzymes, fermentation. So there is crossover possible. Methodologies are very often interchangeable. And as always, as with every process, be it bread making, be it beer making, be it bioethanol, whatever, know your ingredients or substrates, know your product, know your process. This is crucially important if you want to do research or if you want to improve products. Last slide, uh, some collaborators, uh, lab of food chemistry, a list of people, lab of genetics and genomics, so Kevin, Elham, Jan, Carl St. Lieve, so some of the beer uh, work was done together with Hido and Gert, and then smart people for rheology. So with this, I would like to conclude. I hope you have learned something that can be applicable in the beer industry. If not, I had fun, so thank you for your attention. So for me, it's really clear how yeast can influence the, the living ability to rheology, but flavor is a bit more obscure maybe because you have the, the higher temperature and evaporation and all, but is it known which kind of aroma compounds do influence uh, bread flavor? If, do you have any idea about that? Uh, people in Germany have done a lot of work on that. The uh, DFA, for example, yeah. Peter Schiebele has worked a lot on, um, a lot has worked on uh, aromas in, in bread. And it's actually indeed a complex matter. So you have to make a distinction between bread crust on the one hand and bread uh, crumb on the other hand, because bread crust is mostly driven by Maillard reaction products and so on, while the crumb is mostly related to beer, uh, to um, yeast metabolites. Although a large portion of the metabolites is actually baked off during uh, the process of, of baking. So um, which actual components are influencing the flavor the most, I cannot tell you at this time. So, yeah. Christoph, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, I have two comments. Number one, I'd like to say we've done similar work to you to check if brewing yeast work on bread. And I can tell you that there is a lot of brewing yeast to much better baking, have better baking capabilities than any baker's yeast has, so I think maybe the yeast producers have to rethink where they get their strains from. Um, and number two was your comments on Arabinoxylin, which I'm 
quite excited about it because when you think of spent grain and a 10 to 20 percent of your spent grain is actually arabinox island which is a lot and you mentioned that you might have a, a prebiotic status so i was just wondering could you uh, comment on the current efsa um, where does it stand with EFSA? Is it approved as a prebiotic? And second, you mentioned that with two and a half grams of arabinoxylin, you get uh, physiological effects with humans. What are those? Is it mainly the prebiotic or the dietary fiber, or is there more there? Um, with regard to EFSA and prebiotics, the answer is very simple. There's no approval whatsoever of any prebiotic uh, at the moment, so that's clear. Um, I think it will change in the future, but the problem is that to get these claims, a lot of in investments have to be done, and the food industry is not a real uh, big margin industry, so a lot of companies do not want to touch on that, or not too much. So the big ones, yes, Nestle, Danone, and that sort of companies, I think they will drive this forward. Um, the term prebiotic is under discussion, but I think it's a very good term to have to show the, the concept. Yeah. Uh, secondly, your question was about the physiological effect. So the physiological effect that I was referring to is that when you consume 2 to 2.5 grams of axles a day, that you do see shifts in your nitrogen metabolism. Um, the amount of nitrogen being taken up by the, by the body versus the amount of nitrogen being excreted through feces and urine uh, will change. Is that a health effect? No, it's not a health effect. It's just showing that by doing this, by eating this, that you have changes in the metabolism, either in gut microflora or actual metabolism. And that's why I said it's a physiological effect without going into whether it's a healthy effect or not. <laughs>